this afternoon, we've got Robert uh, from Grass Valley, yeah. and Robert is going to talk to us about an OB van build using 2110. Take it away, Robert. Thank you, sir. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out. I do appreciate it. The, uh, I always think this is a very good area to kind of talk about things we've learned, things we haven't, because it's a smaller crowd. You know, if we've got 400 people and a whole bunch of questions, you're not going to go very far. So, as I go through this, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, we'll have some time at the end, too. Uh, but since we got this size crowd, it's really a disservice if we don't just have an interactive conversation. Cool? All right. So, uh, we were presented with a challenge uh, from a customer who said, I need to build a truck, but it's not just a truck, it's also gonna be a production facility, it's also gonna be a bunch of fly packs, and I need to be able to move assets around. Well, we've never really heard anybody say, I can do that in SDI, because you have to recable every single time you wanna move assets around in the SDI domain. So the customer said, this is our workflow requirements. And this is what I like having these conversations. I don't like having the conversations that start, I need an IP truck. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is the only way we can solve this is with IP. But starting the conversation with, here's my workflow, here's my challenges, what technology is available to meet those workflows and meet those challenges? And this one came pretty quick that the only way we could do it was over IP. And the customer had another requirement, was it has to be open. I need a COTS-based environment. You know, I can't use the proprietary IP infrastructure, I can't use the closed ecosystem. I want to use what I consider is the best manufacturers out there for my facility. So because of that, uh, we had to have a COTS-based infrastructure. So the second is once we decided we wanted to go COTS, the customer decided on Arista. Uh, you know, we've done a lot with a lot of other manufacturers, so I'm not saying that uh, we pushed them in this direction. That's the one nice thing about open architectures is, is that customers are allowed to choose what they think is best. This customer went with Arista. Uh, since the truck was built last year, um, looking at all the standards, there was no point in going 2022-6 or anything like that. Go 2110. That one was pretty easy at this point. And it had a mixed reference, envi reference environment. And I will say this one thing as a design consideration. Just because your facility decides to go 2110 doesn't mean that all the gear in your facility will be 2110. You will have old SDI devices that still need Blackburst. So we had to have a reference environment that was a mix of PTP and Blackburst. Another part, and this is where things come in very, very nice, is for IP is signal agnostic. Their launch customer was 1080i. Their second customer was 1080i. Their third customer was gonna be 1080i. But they didn't know if the fourth customer was gonna be UHD or HDR. So again, without having to recable the entire facility, we had a design for UHD. And simplified wiring. They wanted everything to be multi-mode and single mode fiber. You'll see why here in a little bit once I get into some pictures. Um, but again, this, this the solution was designed to be very dynamic and chains from production to production and production. And if you're doing coax or any kind of traditional wiring, it's just not possible. Now, their technical requirements, and this is a big one, eight simultaneous productions. You know, they needed eight switchers, eight producers, eight, eight technical directors, eight of all this, is the maximum amount of productions they see themselves doing at one time. So as you're seeing now, this isn't just a normal OB man. Um, it, had, it had, that was a part of it, but they needed to scale even beyond that. One of their requirements is as much IP at the edge as possible. Well, what does that mean? You probably see this from a lot of people. We don't want to be in the world that we sell gateways. As a manufacturer, I love selling gateways. As a customer, that's capital that may not be used in two, three, four, five years once everything is direct IP. So the whole concept of IP at the edge as possible is you want your cameras to be IP, you want your switchers to be IP, you want your multiviewers to be IP, you want as much stuff at the edge that's direct IP so you don't have to use gateways. Uh, IP switchers kind of reinfor reinforces that. They've said, you know what, I don't want a traditional SDI switcher. I don't want to have 100 gateways for all my switchers. I want my switchers to be native IP. So. That one's actually pretty tough because there's not, not a lot of manufacturers right now that can do the entire switcher 2110 native without any gateways or without any external processing. Uh, they had a very large multi-view requirement, roughly 960 inputs feeding 80 displays. Uh, this is another one that would be very hard to do over IP or over uh, SDI. If I had to feed 80 multi-viewers with 960 inputs over SDI, I'm either gonna have a router dedicated just to multi-viewing or I'm gonna have a whole bunch of DAs. So, um, 
audio and video. Video we already kind of addressed. Audio, uh, they have audio consoles and they have, they have mics all over the entire facility. They don't want to have to be pulling a bunch of MADI connections or a bunch of uh, AES connections. They want to get everything into the 2110-30 as soon as they can. Uh, they had some stuff that was Dante and some stuff that was Ravenna that was converted to 2110-30, uh, but that was one of the requirements. Uh, remote production, we'll go into that. And this is the last part that I think is really important. Flexible FPGA processing. And you, hear, you might hear this a lot in trade magazines and so forth, but what does that mean? You heard me say earlier that we don't want to use gateways because that's just an SDI to IP and IP back to SDI conversion. Well, what happens when everything's IP and you don't really need those gateways anymore? You just spend however many hundreds of thousands of dollars on gateways that just go in a bucket. Well, what if that gateway you have with a software license can now become a multi-viewer? Or what if the gateway you bought can now be a J2K encoder or decoder? Or what if the gateway you bought can now be an IP up converter, down converter, and, and cross converter? That allows you to kind of reuse the assets you've already bought with software licenses to make them adaptable. And so that's what we talk about with flexible FPGA programming. So this is the, the key part. And if you guys have ever seen any of my presentations before, I always put it in here because this is the one requirement every customer always asks for. Users don't know or care about the technology. As a vendor, it kind of hurts a little bit. You know, hey, I want you guys' product to be so awesome, we, we don't even have to think about it, we don't talk about it, we don't worry about it, we don't care about it. In all honesty, that's a successful deployment. If the creative people who are generating the content you need to be generated are given the tools that are designed correctly, they won't care about the tools. It's just, a, it's just the ability to generate the content they need. So, a little details on the uh, facility. The main core was an Arista 7508R. Um, again, because they required a, a COTS core, but here's an interesting part. It's a large single chassis. A lot of our customers are requiring leaf spine architectures. This is not, this is a larger single chassis. Well, if you do the math right now, a 36 port 100 gig switch gives you roughly between 800 and 1200 squared router in one RU. Depends on flow management and things along those lines. That's one RU on one switch. That's an incredible amount of bandwidth. So if you need larger infrastructures, obviously you can just add more line cards and add more line cards and add more line cards. Now the reason a lot of people use leaf spine architectures is because you have to break out those 100 gig ports into a whole bunch of little 10 gig and 25 gig and 50 gig ports. Well, what happens if a lot of your architecture is 100 gig native? Your multiviewers are 100 gig native or your switchers are 100 gig native. You don't need to break it out. So you can kind of simplify that architecture quite a bit. That's something we're able to use. By the way, I'm not condoning large monolithic architectures compared to leaf spine. They both are entirely valid and they both uh, are key to distributions. So I don't, you know, want to be coming back and saying, hey, you know, this Grass Valley guy says leaf spine isn't best. It's leaf spine is the best for what the workflow requires. This workflow didn't require it. So uh, first off on the gateways, um, you can have gateways that are 32 inputs and 32 outputs or 16 inputs and 16 outputs. The catch is, is you always want to have a very small failure block. When you design solutions, it doesn't matter if it's SDI or IP, you have to design the solution to fail. Otherwise, it's not properly engineered. If you design the system that is always going to work all the time, there's never going to be any problems, and then life goes on unicorns and rainbows, well, that's just not how it is. You have to understand that there will be a failure, whether it's a Grass Valley product or an Arista product or a control system or whatever, you have to design it to fail. If you design things to fail, having gateways that have small impact blocks, you know, eight in, eight out, nine in, nine out, that kind of stuff is a way of engineering a solution. So if there is a failure, it's not gonna have a huge impact on the entire facility. And we already talked about the flexible FPGA core and the fact that we can take these multiviewers and are these gateways, and if they're not used as gateways anymore, turn them into a multiviewer. Or if the customer also needs more multiviewers, we can leverage the gateways. So multiviewers had to be IP. There's no way around it. You just cannot scale to that many displays with that many sources on any kind of facility without having IP. Uh, we already discussed the IP switchers. Um, every switcher in this facility was native IP. Uh, there was a small amount of SDI capable, but for this part really was not leveraged at all. SDN control was absolutely key. When you have gear from so many different vendors, 
going through so many different types of uh, workflows and architectures, having a flexible control domain was absolutely key to this. And unified facility control and monitoring was absolutely key. If an operator has a problem, and they might not know about multicast media flows, they might not know about SDN, they might not know about how does IGMP V2 or V3 work, or you know, how does an endpoint in initiate a, multi a multicast join. If the operator doesn't know, or if the engineer doesn't know that, which in honesty most engineers today don't, you have to give a tool set that allows them to quickly diagnose the problem. So that was a very important part. And to reiterate the point, they wanted as much IP at the edge as possible. So let's look at the topologies. It was broken up into three parts, a broadcast center, remote fly packs, and a mid-sized production truck. So we'll start, we'll start on the broadcast center. I know people in the back may not be able to read this, my apologies, but we gotta work with what we got here. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing redundant uh, IP cores, uh, redundant PTP clocks. By the way, they took PTP to an, an area that I, I actually personally agree with. They didn't buy it all from one vendor. You know, they did PT, uh, one of the PTP clocks was by Tech, the other PTP clock was by Mindberg. Is it more complicated? Sure. But I personally like having not all my eggs in one basket. I thought that was actually a pretty good solution. Um, they had um, multiple switchers with all native uh, 40 gig or 50 gig links. So again, there was no SDI in there. Uh, then we had the standard control panel. So again, the, to the operators, there was no difference between an SDI infrastructure and an IP infrastructure. The control panels still say camera one, server one, monitor one, whatever they need to say. That was one of the larger uh, parts of it. And now we notice the 100 gig links feeding the multiviewers. Again, if you do 100 gig links for places that have large amounts of aggregation, save yourself from money from having to go leaf spine, go with the 100 gig and call it good. That's exactly what they did. So this is the part that I actually thought was really interesting is on the remote sites. They had the requirements where, you know what, sometimes I might need a large switcher and a very large multiviewer on a remote facility. But the next day, I might actually need two smaller switchers and two smaller remote kits. So what they did is they designed four different types of fly packs of four different sizes. So one fly pack was made of a larger Arista switch that was very short filled. You know, it only had two or three line cards in it uh, with an IP switcher, with IP gateways, with IP multiviewers. And again, you notice two different types of PTP generators. And these, were, these two are kind of very similar in scale. But once you go into the fly packs three or four, these are smaller kits. These are smaller switchers smaller IP cores, or even on this one, again, I, I hate, I don't like to use the word small on IP. Again, a, a one RU 36 port 100 switch is roughly enough for 800 by 800 worth of routing. That's not very small. You know, a few years ago, that was an eight RU box. <laughs> so uh, when I say small, it's, it's in comparison to some of these other ones that can handle up to 30, 40 or 50,000 flows. Um, so the idea on these are, is if they needed to come together to do one large production, they can tie two of these fly packs together and now they have the larger production. Or if they need even a larger scale, they tie three or four of these fly packs together and the system scales. This is something you can never do in IP or in SDI. You can only do this in IP. And now we go to the midsize truck. And you'll notice this is mainly just, uh, it's a pretty simple design where we got 24 cameras feeding a midsize switch, feeding a midsize switcher, and this is just your traditional midsize OB truck. The advantage of this solution is though, is when they had the, the remote facility and the, re and the flyaway kits and the truck all tied together, it all works as one environment. They all share resources. And that's an important part about IP. There was no concepts of tie lines. There was no concepts of blocking architectures. There was enough bandwidth architected into this solution where if they needed to pull the resources they can from multiple facilities, they can. That was pretty huge. So let's talk about the challenges. Audio routing in an all IP environment gets a little more complicated once you go into mono level audio routing. So if you're using gateways and you can control the gateways with your control system, audio routing isn't too bad of a thing because you're controlling it with your control system, your environment. But what happens if I have a manufacturer that has a device, let's say replay, and that device needs a 2110-30 level A eight channel mix. And I need to pull sources from four different sources. 
you know, I need audio, you know, one channel of audio to come from an audio mixer. I need one channel of audio to come from a replay box. I need one channel of audio to come from a floor mic and one channel of audio to come from another place. If the device only handles one 2110-30 level A input, how's that gonna work? How are you gonna pull audio from four different sources since the audio is all trunked? Traditionally, in 2110, we never do auto, mono audio level routing through the fabric. It's usually trucks, you know, groups of four channels or groups of eight channels or groups of 16 channels. It's a big challenge. And again, if you're using gateways, it's easy to get around. But if you're using a native IP environment, you need an audio router in the middle to be able to, to take all of these individual sources and then create a 2110-30 level A feed to feed that endpoint device. So that was one of the challenges that we actually ended up doing here is we ended up designing a COTS-based IP audio router. IP in, IP out. It could take in thousands of channels of audio and then it creates the IP trunks that need to be sent to the edge devices. It gets a little complicated because you look at all the, the requirements for edge devices. Some people can handle four channels. Some people require eight. Some people require 18. The standard says that everybody has to conform to level A. In reality, not everybody actually does. Um, granted, they're busting the, uh, the standard in that, in that terminology, but that still doesn't help the customer. So having that flexible audio router in the middle was really important to be able to do all the channel swaps and also identify all of the uh, potential levels, whether it's A, B, or C of 2110-30 that was involved. Now we mentioned the flexible FPG platform. Turns out making flexible FPGAs is really easy. Anybody that says it's a big deal, it's not. <laughs> The, the complication is actually on the commercial side. So as a vendor, I want, if a customer says, I need a multi-viewer on my, on my card, I, as a vendor, probably didn't charge them for a day one. They just got the gateway. But they're gonna need to buy the license from us for the, to turn the multi-viewer on. So how do we handle licensing? If the truck is in the middle of a show and they need a multi-viewer, they might be a little mad if they called up our salesperson and said, hey, I need my, my number, Can here's my credit card, could you please send that to me? Would you imagine that go bad? Probably. So handling licensing of flexible FPGA resources in remote facilities is a little complicated. There's different business models you can do, uh, but it's something that has to be concerned. So that's the overview. Is there any, uh, any questions, any comments, or anything that uh, we can interject on? I have a question for you. Yes, sir. So... If you would start now, start this project over again. Yes. What would you do differently uh, in two respects? One, what did you learn? But two, has there been any progress in the uh, availability of equipment or in the standards or other things that also would contribute to a different approach? The biggest thing we're missing on this is ISO 4 and ISO 5. Um, in order for this truck to work in the time frame that we had to do, we ended up writing a fair amount of, of protocols to talk to other third-party vendors um, in order for that to work. Um, we haven't seen ISO, in this case ISO 5, really scale to the size we need, and we haven't seen that really kind of proofed out or mature yet. Um, that's what we really need. We really need to see the ISO 4, which is for the most part been vetted out, but we really need to see ISO 5 grow up. We need to see it be more... You want to explain what, what those are, just in case our audience I apologize. doesn't know. So ISO 4 is the ability to plug in a device. Right. Yeah, we have a nice demonstration over here. But ISO 4 is the ability to plug in a device, and it can automatically discover the device. But more importantly, it discovers and registers its capabilities. So you know, it used to be when I plugged in a camera into an SDI network, I knew that it was going to be 10, you know, 1.5 gig or 3 gig or 720p or 1080i. And it was some pretty basic stuff. When I plug, um, let's say, a server into a network now, the gear on the rest of the network has no idea what its capabilities are. I could be a server, I could create four video channels and 16 audio channels, or I could be a server that does one video and one audio and one metadata. I could be 1080i, I could be 720p, I could be UHD, I could be AK. There has to be a mechanism for when a device comes on the network that it tells the rest of the devices on the network and registers its capabilities on the network. So that's a really important part. In my opinion, slightly more important, because that part we can work around in a very manual way. The part that's, that's, that can't be worked around is ISO 5. Now, when you do a route in an IP network, the device that needs to receive the flow has to ask for it. So if I'm a server, my server says, you know what, I need to receive camera one. Camera one is 239.0.0.1. Port 10,000, please send that to me. 
So that means the control system has to be able to talk to the end device, the edge device. Now, if it's a Grass Valley control system and a Grass Valley edge device, that's easy peasy, it's all us. But what happens if, well, we got a guy from Lao here, so what, if, what happens if it's a Grass Valley control system and a Lao card? We're friends, we'll get a beer. We're not exactly really good about opening how all of our software works to each other. And that's a little, that's kind of how it is. So ISO 5 gives us a common API that our control system or their control system or our endpoints or their endpoints can work together to communicate. Without that API, you're going to have to write a custom protocol for every edge device on your network. Now, if you guys want to pay us $20,000 for every one we, we write, sure. You don't want to do that. Honestly, for us, we don't want to do that. So that's the importance of ISO 5. So until we get ISO 4 and ISO 5 to a more mature state, where we, we've, we've nailed the scale, we've nailed the functionality, and we can actually truly rely on an environment, that's what we need. And you know, every time we get together here at this, at this showcase, more devices are doing ISO 4 and more devices are doing ISO 5. But until we get true maturity, that's what we're missing. Yeah, and a couple of points on that. Uh, John Myatt from Imagine was over here yesterday and kept str uh, stressing the point over and over to the group that was here, ISO 5 is done. It's done. By the way, did I say it's done? Mm -hmm. um, and so it really is at a point that people can adopt it, but we need the users to really understand what it does, which is, you know, if you've got a camera and you've got a monitor, you plug those into an SDI crossbar router and you go to the control panel, you can route the, route the camera to the monitor and the image shows up. If you've got a camera with an IP connector on it, and you plug it into an IT COTS router and you got a multi-viewer and you plug that into a COTS router, where is the control panel? What's the common way that you tell the multi-viewer to join the stream that's coming from that camera? So at a high level, that's what ISO 5 does. It's, it is done. To quote John, did I mention that? Um, but we do need more people to understand what it does, and when you talk to manufacturers, what they will tell you is when people ask me for it, then I will do it, because otherwise I don't have any demand for it. So that's one, the, the answer to that, as far as the status of that goes. Um, as far as the scalability goes, um, you guys should know that Sony has been doing, within the AMWA, openly, has been doing some large-scale scalability testing on the NMOS suite and they're going to be giving a presentation at the HPA, the, or not HPA, the SEMPTE uh, fall conference mm -hmm. in Hollywood about their results uh, on scalability. But this is a real concern. I happened to see Michael Cotter the other day from Turner and he was telling me that they were looking at somewhere around 450,000 flows within a, uh, a facility uh, that's a combined facility between Atlanta and New York. So the industry really has to get to a point where we can validate exactly. with, with real test results and that's the part we that, that it does scale. Yeah. And so I think with the IP showcase, we have always had this be a presentation about the state of the industry as it is, mm -hmm. and we always are working to improve this as the industry moves forward with the technology. So I appreciate your frank response about where we are. And we're working hard together to try and uh, yep. clear those issues and then, you know, address other issues that are in the pipeline to, to be worked on. So. Mm -hmm.